if interest is an omnipresent phenomenon and the ultra-low rates wormed their way into all economic and financial activity, then it would follow that the everything bubble turns into the everything bust in inverted commas. Welcome to the Investor Arma podcast. I'm really delighted to have Edward Chancellor on the show today, the author of not one, but two of my favorite. He's a financial historian, journalist, and investment strategist. His latest book, The Price of Time, was published very timely in 2022. And it seems like interest rates are the main driver of everything these days. So I'm really pleased to introduce Edward. Welcome to the show. Yeah, George, thanks for having me. So we'd like to start to get to know you better. And I mentioned you're a historic investment strategist. And it's obvious when you look at the books, how those two are combined. But it's an interesting career choice, especially in the age of quant, which I think dominates finance today. So can you tell us how you got into this and how you created this interest in history of finance? I mean, I read history at university and did a postgraduate course in history. I read history because it was a subject that interested me. I felt I suppose it wasn't a career choice. I was thinking that if you studied history, you'd have perhaps an, an option on a variety of different career choices. So I hadn't really thought about that I would end up in the world of finance uh, or investment. Uh, but when I left, when I finished my postgraduate degree and decided not to be an academic, I got a job in the city of London working actually on the investment banking side at Lazard. So that. At that stage, I would have thought, you know, in my in my mid twenties, that my interest in history uh, was no longer going to be of of any sort of professional use to me. That that's what I thought at the time. And uh, we see in the book, did it evolve into an edge in your investment? So I'll, I'll tell you what happened. I I didn't like corporate finance; didn't suit me personally. So I decided to leave the bank and. While I'd been there, I'd heard these stories, as you do, about the great speculative manias of the past. You know, people mentioning, I don't know, the railway mania of the 1840s or tulip mania in Holland of the 1630s. So I started reading up about them, and I found that the sort of main book that people cited and went back to time and time again, Charles Mackay's Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. And it was clearly, that book was written in the 1840s. It was obviously out of date. A lot, of happen, a lot had happened since then. But also it was, it, although it's a good read, it's full of it, inaccuracies. And I thought it would be interesting to take that up to date. And there is obviously, as you're aware, you know, the great book by Charles Kindleberger, Mainers, Panics and Crashes, which deals with the same subject, but it's really a taxonomy of the boom and the bust, not a narrative history. So I decided anyhow to write this narrative of the history of financial speculation, which came out in, in 99. And that was, it came out fortuitously, um, just at the sort of, as the dot-com bubble was reaching its peak. And I suppose at that moment, you begin to realize that actually the study of history is a useful, is a useful practice for, for active investors. And what's happening at the time, as, you, as you're aware, is that the you know, certain institutional investors weren't buying into the TMT bubble and, and they were thrashing around to to discover why, you know, why, what they thought was wrong. And they started reading history and, they, and a lot of them started reading my book. And that really got me into the investment world. And a few years later, Jeremy Grantham, who was running GMO in, in Boston, a big institutional investor, investment firm, uh, where your offices for a while were just beneath us. And, and Jeremy offered me a job. So, so really the study of, of, history and investment and the fact that this these historical insights into the speculative mania were useful in real time for investors is what sort of brought me 
into, that was my bridge into the investment world and into working at GMO. And actually on the subject of quants, as you're aware, GMO is largely what they call a quant shop. In other words, you know, they use a lot of data to, um, you know, and run portfolios based on value metrics. So, and a lot of the people there have, you know, PhD in maths and physics and economics. And when Jeremy wanted to hire me, I said, you know, I have to say, I'm not a quant. And he's, I'm not a quant either. So he obviously felt, you know, there was room at the firm for having someone whose, whose discipline wasn't purely sort of quantitative and, and mathematical. Yeah, I think this is so interesting. And I think I said that they're my favorite books. They're not just nice to read for me. They're books that I, help me frame my thinking in terms of investment. And this, well, you know, I just mentioned to you before we talked that there's only now apparently only 2% of Harvard graduated that go into humanity. I mean, I could elaborate a tiny bit. If you specialize in purely sort of quantitative approaches, that may be fine in, you know, when you're dealing in, a, you know, in real sciences, in physics, in medicine. But when you, when you're approaching the activities of human beings, we can, you know, we are not human beings and uh, you know, can't be studied in the same way. We're not so predictable as molecules or planets. You remember there's this famous, probably apocryphal quotation ascribed to Isaac Newton at the time of the South Sea bubble. Isaac Newton, he was master of the mint, in charge of Britain's currency and, and speculated a bit in the great South Sea bubble of 1720. And there's this I think apocryphal statement of Newton, it fits the bill where Newton is asked something about what he thinks is going to happen to the South Sea stock. And he replies, I can calculate the movement of the heavenly planets, but not the madness of men. Now, a quant can calculate the movements of the heavenly planets like Newton, but you need other disciplines including the discipline of a historian to understand the madness of men. And why do you need that discipline? Because in the world of finance and investment, we have these regularly repeating activities. So you have, as I say, historically, you have these great, you know, these great speculative bubbles that have gone on from the tulip mania through to the current day. And not just the bubbles, but we've had these tremendous credit booms that have gone on also, you know, probably since the 18th century onwards. And what you notice about this largely quant filled world in which the economists themselves are part, the economists, a lot of modern economists, you know, move over into postgraduate. They actually take up economics after their undergraduate course having done an undergraduate course in mathematics, because that is the skill most valued in today's economics courses and in the discipline. One of my very good friends at Cambridge University here got a double first in, in maths, did a maths PhD, and then went over to economics, which he did at Harvard PhD. So that, he, and he's a very bright guy. There's no doubt about it. He's much brighter than me. However, the way he was taught economics, the way he thinks about it, is all in terms of model. And th these models have to be mathematically tractable. But if the study of mankind is not mathematically tractable, then these models are not really accurate or useful. So then go back, let's go back over the last 25 years. What have we had? We've had the tech boom, uh, dot com boom of the late 1990s. At the time, the economists were telling us that we lived in perfectly efficient markets and that the markets computed rationally all, all available information that was out there. And if you know, the US stock market was trading on 35 times earnings, that was fine because as Alan Greenspan said at the time, the market was telling you that corporate profits were going to be higher in future. Okay, that turned out to be wrong. And the markets crashed. And the moment after the markets crashed, everyone said, hey, wasn't that a bubble? If you've been a historian, and I'm not, you know, I don't take any credit, but if you've been a historian, you say, hmm, these late 1990s stock market, 
hell of a lot like the British railway mania of the 1840s. You've got a new technology, uh, a new tri communications technology. People are getting very excited about it. There's a lot of quite sort of dubious practice, let's call it, let's put it politely, going on in the financial markets. You've got a lot of people being sucked into the markets and so on. Very, very similar pattern. And what happens in the 1840s and what happens really with all perspective markets, perspective bubbles, by definition, is they later collapse. So if you knew the history, you were aware of the vulnerability of the market. And then, you know, then after the dot-com bust, I switched my attention then to the history, to, to what was going on in the credit markets and read more about and got into the sort of whole subject of sort of of, of credit booms and busts, which I didn't write up in a, for the sort of retail market, but I produced a, a long report on it for the sort of hedge fund world in 2005, and that was called Crunch Time for Credit. And what I, again, you, I found there is you could draw on this you know, great history of credit booms and busts, and, and you could see that the credit boom had certain, you know, had certain common features. And you could see that it was often associated re with real estate booms and that when you had a real estate boom accompanied by credit boom, it almost, it invariably turned into a bust at some point. Now, look at, at then back to what conventional thinking was in the mid 2000s. It was, this is the way the economists look. Credit growth is immaterial because for every loan, there is a creditor, and therefore they cancel each other out. There's nothing to talk about here. And there was this perception that at the time that inflation was low and the economy, the markets had recovered from the uh, dot-com bust, and we were in this period of the so-called great moderation. But they weren't aware at the time of the dynamic that Hyman Minsky, the American economist who, who died in the mid-1990s, had, had pointed out that periods of, of stability engendered instability. Uh, a sort of, you could say a sort of yin and a yang. The boom gives way to the bust. The boom contains within it the seed of the bust. So in this report, and actually in a later piece, long piece, I wrote for Institutional Investor, uh, which came yes. out in early 2007, I drew on the works of Hyman Minsky. And I combined that the works of Hyman Minsky or the analysis of Hyman Minsky, the, his so-called financial instability hypothesis, with a sort of historical take on credit booms and busts. I you know, often tend to coincide actually with Spectre Manias. And I think that, again, was a case in which history was very useful to understanding what was going on in the financial markets. When I wrote that report, I, I met some veteran economist on, on Wall Street, uh, a guy called Al Vojnilova, who was a contemporary of Henry Kaufman, who used to be at first Boston and was known in his day as Dr. Gloom to Henry Kaufman's Dr. Doom. Anyway, Vojnilo and I were talking about Minsky. This is, let's say, 2006. And I say, why does no one read with Minsky? Why, why is he this prophet in the wilderness? And, uh, and Vojnilo says to me, he's difficult to model, period. Mm. Do you see the point, George? That no, no, absolutely. The true, absolutely. Insight, the true insights, the really useful insights, into the financial world cannot be grasped by models. The, do you remember there's a famous, the, all you need to know about models is so-called Box's law. All, all models are wrong. Some are useful. And I'm afraid to say, when it comes to finance, that sum is a relatively small number of the total number of models. No, no, that's great. And I think... Uh, it... Indeed, it's something that's easily forgotten. And maybe it's not just about models versus history, but also the news versus history, because we are fed constantly yeah. about, oh, this is new, this is different. And therefore, it's so important. So thanks you know, for, for what you've done and for reminding us.
But now I would like to move on to the thesis of the book straight away. And as a transition, I'd like to show you a little video from The Economist, so it's not from any random publication, which I think is perhaps a good summary of, you know, the typical view on interest rates and inflation. We can see right from the beginning that there's two things, interest rates and inflation and nothing else. So let's just listen to one minute of it. It keeps the economy moving at a sensible speed. But inflation staying high for too long is a problem. Higher prices means employees will need higher wages, pushing up costs for businesses. That could drive up prices further, potentially leading to an upward spiral of wages and prices. Central bankers are really concerned about setting expectations of inflation. The idea is that if it can show that it is credible, that it will always act to get inflation back down to 2%, then maybe it won't have to you know, raise interest rates and then lower them in this kind of seesaw fashion. Raising interest rates can slow an economy right down. It's kind of what I would say the consensus is you raise interest rate if there's inflation and for no other reason. And as soon as there's no inflation, you lower it right down. Maybe it's a bit simplified, but that's the way I see it. And I would love to hear your first impression on this and then we can go about your thesis. Um, well, I agree that from The Economist represent, uh, insofar as I gather from it, a conventional view, interest should only be considered in relation to the bank. And it's true, George, that if you look at the history of interest and the history of interest rates, there has been a you know, connection between the interest rate and the control of inflation. I mean, I can give you an example from the, you know, from the 19th century, when we had the gold standard, what would happen is this, is you'd have a boom period, credit growth, which would then feed through into rising prices. And as prices rose in one country, relative to another, those goods would become uncompetitive, as you can imagine. And what would happen when they would become uncompetitive? A country would then would then start producing a, a balance of payments deficit because it was selling fewer exports and and the imports were relatively cheaper. And that would cause gold to flow out of the country and the central bank would then find that it had less gold so it would raise interest rates. And at the point at which interest rates increased strong enough to the sort of to hurt the economy and the, and the financial system, you would then tend to get a little sort of a bust or even a big bust. And you tend to then get a deflation or credit deflation and a deflation of, of consumer prices, of commodities. And then after a while, the system would stabilize and a new business cycle would appear. And in the long run, to take it over the course of the 19th century, say from Britain, we this raising of interest rates during the boom period and during the balance payments deficits served to keep prices stable. So over the course of the 19th century, sterling, for instance, kept its value relative to gold for the entire century. And then go into, you know, since uh, early 1970s, we've completely severed any connection between money and gold. And so the value of money is really sort of retained just by a consensus as to it having value. However, initially, after leaving, breaking with gold, we had in the 1970s, the great inflation. And that great inflation in the US was brought to an end by extremely high interest rates under the Volcker Fed. So, uh, you know, U.S. US in short-term rates uh, went up. I think prime rates went up to around 20% in the early 1980s. And you know, that caused a very severe, it caused two severe recessions in the United States. But in the end, the inflation genie was slain, or I you know say the inflation dragon was slain. And we ha then had, you know, a long period of first falling inflation and then quiescence. 
So I have no argument with the claim that interest is useful to control inflation. It is one of its functions. But I do have a, an argument with the view that the only role of interest is to control inflation. Because, and this is why I wrote this book, The Price of Time. My argument is that we have had interest since the dawn of history. And if you look, I mean, as you know, in, in the first chapter of my book, I, I look at the origins of interest in ancient Mesopotamia. And we then have a, a continuous history of interest and interest rates from that period to the current day. And it seems, you know, it seems extremely unlikely that you would have a phenomenon such as interest with, you know, charge on lend if there wasn't some, if interest wasn't serving some fundamental purpose. Think about it this way. If you go back to an era before bank and when you have a purely metallic current, well, you wouldn't need interest to control inflation because Inflation would be determined by the supply of money and the supply of goods and services. So you wouldn't need it. So it obviously doesn't make any sense to say that interest is only exists to control inflation. It doesn't fit the historical record. And you know, what, so what I'm trying to do in the book is to tease out these vital other functions of interest, of which you know, we can talk about them, but I'll give you a sort of brief summary now is, first of all, the role that interest plays in the valuation of assets, which is absolutely vital to people in the investment world. Secondly, the role that interest plays in the allocation of capital. Thirdly, the role that interest plays in the pricing of risk. Fourthly, the influence of interest on savings and pensions. And fifthly, on global capital flows. So you've got these other role that interest plays that are independent of the role of interest controlling inflation. But we've lived you know, since the, I think since, you could say since the Second World War, we've lived in a world in which the view of interest is very narrow and is really interest as a policy lever to both control inflation and to, if you will, smooth the business to bring down interest rates to the bust so that you can revive the economy going forward. You know, it's largely what you know, it's called the sort of neo-Keynesian consensus view of monetary policy making. And it really derives, I think, from the influence Keynes had, British economist Keynes had, on economics. Because Keynes's view was, was largely that interest wasn't useful. It didn't serve these different roles, functions of interest that I mentioned didn't mean anything to Keynes. Keynes thought that interest was used, was really needed in order to get people to stop hoarding money. In other words, think of it, you're sitting on a pile of cash and you wouldn't, you wouldn't lend that money, that cash, unless you were induced with the interest. Which, and that's not a crazy idea. But again, it, you know, it, to me, that, that would be one of the minor functions. Uh, so, so, um, so what can I say? I say interest is really at heart of uh, all economic and financial activity. I think the great American economist Irving Fisher, uh, who wrote a book called The Theory of Interest, which came out, I think, in fact, 1930. And Fisher says you know, interest is, is an omnipresent phenomenon. As Jim Grant, you know, the, my friend, the great US financial journalist and historian, he's in, Interest is the universal price. It, it, it affects everything. And if you really understand interest, you might argue that you don't really understand the capitalist system or you don't really understand economics. You don't really understand financial markets. It's really, I mean, I don't want to talk up my book too much, but you know, th this is really the journey I was on because I felt I hadn't really understood this subject. Well enough, which is why I read. So, so the book was you. You didn't come to the book with a thesis. It's something that uh, you discover through the process. No, I, it, I did come with a thesis, which was 
Oh, yeah, the previous article. No, I, I was thinking this. Extent. Is first of all, I, I felt I blocked that small school of people who thought that the very low interest rates of the Greenspan Fed you know, in 2001, when the Fed funds rate was taken down to 1%, was a you know, major factor in, in igniting the US real estate boom and the subprime boom. So I, mean, I, I thought that that played a role in the global financial crisis. But then, as you know, I was working at a GMO after the crisis. And what we were finding is that, you know, a lot of asset markets moving back into sort of bubble, bubble areas immediately after the financial crisis, commodities, um, commodities were all in bubbles after financial crisis. And you had, you know, huge amount of risk taking, uh, capital flows into emerging markets, into debt instruments. And we found that, you know, bond yields were very low. U.S. Re um, stock market valuations were very high by historic levels. And I was thinking, these are very strange markets and you can't really understand them without reference to what was at the time, you know, uh, Fed funds rate close to zero. So that, that was, I didn't, it was only later that I sort of broke down, you know, that I got deeper into the function of interest. But I felt by the middle of the last decade, you couldn't really understand the world unless you understood interest. And you have to bear in mind, George, that there was the Fed funds rate of 0% and the negative interest rates in, in Europe and in Japan. And the Japan came slightly later in 2016. But those, you know, zero rates and negative rates were the lowest interest rates in five millennia of history. So that, that obviously has to be a noteworthy factor. Yes. And you have a great quote as well in the book. I don't have it exactly, but I think it's from Warren Buffett. So Warren, interest rates is the gravity that holds everything together. Yeah, I think, I think Buffett says... Interest rates are to valuation what gravity is to matter. And actually, I, I thought a bit more about that Buffett quotate since, the, you know, since I actually used it in the book. And namely, you can see, I think Buffett's correct in that point, interest rates be, being like, like gravity uh, to matter. But it's not just valuation. It, it's, as I say, all these other things, the allocation of capital, the amount of risk people take, the amount they borrow, the amount they save. So you could say that interest rate is like gravity to the entire system. Yeah? And there's this Yale economic historian called Bill Goetzman, who wrote a book called Money Changes Everything. And Goetzman makes this interesting, I think, valid point that the invention of interest is the most important invention in the history of finance because it allows people to transact across time. All our economic and financial actions are across time, what we call intertemporal. And if you think, Goetzman also says that um, finance is like a, a spaceship travel takes you through time. Now, with that, if you think of it this way, if, if you have a wrong interest, you can imagine that suddenly the planets no longer move along the paths that they're accustomed to move, but they find themselves sort of in the wrong place, so to speak. Or if you go in, if you set off in, in Gertzman's spaceship traveling across time, you, you will find if you use the wrong, if the interest rates are somehow skewed or distorted, you will end up in the wrong place. Uh, in, in technical terms, you'd say you would be in a position of intertemporal, uh, intertemporal disequilibrium. In other words, you know, the valuations would be wrong, there would be too much debt, too little savings, and so on and so forth. And I think, frankly, that is you know, where we've got to through manipulating and playing around with interest rates over, over you know, recent decades. Yeah, that's a really interesting quote, and looking at the future. And also, what, what matters to investors, I've got a, another great quote from a future guest, which is Dan Davis, who wrote to come forward, and he says, stock market capitalizes expectation of future profit, 
literally is a place where claims of those profits are turned into capital. The story is turned into cash. And, you know, today, the story is with zero interest rates. Well, it feels to me it's the best story that wins. Because the story is about the future. If we discount it to zero, uh, that's our only reference. I think the CEOs, the greatest, let's say the CEOs of this decade, the main quality is probably being a great storyteller. Yeah, and um, I think that's right. So look, think of it technically. The interest rate informs the discount rate or capitalization rate that is used uh, to value asset. And if you have a low discount rate, then assets whose income, or businesses, let's say, whose income is in the distant future will have a higher relative valuation. And so what you find is that investments become more speculative as the interest rate is lowered. And so it's no coincidence that in recent years there's been this great boom on Silicon Valley, one that, you know, this week is coming to an abrupt bust. Boom in Silicon Valley, George, you think of it two, two ways. One, it's to do simply with the discount rate. You know, money, I cite in the book, you know, these venture capitalists saying, you know, hey, money has never been this cheap since the time of the ancient pharaohs. You know, and, you know this is, these are boom times on Silicon Valley. You get more, more or less any, any venture finance, you know, space tourism, you know, cannabis farms, or any number of sort of, of, of semi-fraudulent uh, crypto ventures or electric vehicle ventures. And so money pours into this because these, um, as you say, the person who, who tells the best story, who has these sort of illusory speculative profits in the long distant future, they, they get money. But there's another thing. It's simply that when interest rates are very low, investors need, in order to get you know, their required rate of return on their portfolio, they need to take more speculative bets in order to enhance their returns. So if you've got, you've got two separate forces, or perhaps three, you've got the sort of forces, low discount rates on valuations, you've got easy access to easy money, and you've got investors who are actually, who need to chase speculative investments because at the time of low rates, they're not getting the required returns on other assets. Yes, indeed. And I want to, well, I'm going to have a tiny little break with another little and then I want to discuss about what it means for us today. And there was an interesting trending um, hashtag on Twitter, which is ZIRP, zero interest rate products. People are highlighting some of the things you mentioned, crypto, venture capital, etc. And well, I need to mention explicitly that today we've seen a bank collapse and perhaps another one, Silicon Valley Bank, is in great trouble. So. There are significant things happening. So if you're an investor, if you put your GMO hat, how to think of what interest rates, um, put it very generic, how do you play it? How do you think, consider it in terms of your investment? Um, well, say first of all, I'd say that the very low interest rates of the last decade created what we call the everything bubble, a bubble mm -hmm. in everything. And you, you can see that. Uh, most clearly, if you look at the, you know, the Fed calculates these household net assets figures. I haven't seen them recently. Then, so the household net worth at the end of 21, beginning of last year, uh, was at its highest level in history. And actually, I have a chart in my book showing that the each as of each cycle, the Fed funds rate has come down lower and household net worth has gone up higher. And we know at the end of last year, U.S., Stock market and aggregate was at its highest valuation in history, except for the last few months of the dot com bust. Um, and we know that U.S. household net worth was at its highest level in history, going back to when the Fed started gathering the data in the early 1950s. So I think, in aggregate, to be frank, there are certain losses. Like Keynes once said, "There's no such thing as liquidity for the community as a well. whole." Well. In this instance, there's no such thing as wealth preservation for the community as a whole. U.S. household wealth is trading more than 100 points of GDP 
above its long-term average. Now, I don't think that's sustainable. So you then have to think, you know, well, where are the are, where are the weak points? Yeah. And, you know, last year, you had the bond markets and the stock markets both, you know, falling at times by around, you know, 20%. And you had in aggregate, I've seen one figure of $30 trillion of wealth wiped out. So, and in my view, you know, we're still in the relatively early stages of this period of wealth destruction. And so one of the things you want to look for, and it should already be quite clear, is that what we call long duration assets, you know, bonds, you know, bonds with low yields trading out to with long yields and long maturity date were most exposed. You know, in, in the UK last year, some of the UK government bonds, gilt index linked bonds, fell by 85% in value. You know, these these are supposedly safe assets. So duration, as we call it in investment world is exposed, uh, although less exposed than it was beginning of last year. Then you know, we've already seen the more speculative investments, you know, your your um, SPACs, the special purpose acquisition companies, the tech com you know, tech businesses, uh, big chunks, they've all taken a big hit. I think the, the problems at Silicon Valley Bank are indicative that we're going to have more problems coming out of the venture capital world. I think, you know, from a portfolio perspective, if you remember last year, so-called balanced portfolios of equities and bonds, you know, 60, 40, that, that, did, you know, that, that did. As, as bad as it you know, ever did. And, and in fact, but... except, you know, I, I think it only really came about 60, 40 in the 1990s. That was, apparently it was, actually first mooted by Peter Bernstein, you know, the financial writer, author of Against the Gods. Anyhow, we see at a time, and if you, if you back date, back test the 60-40 portfolio to the 1970s, it was also lost lots of money. So I think conventional portfolio is problematic, having delivered fantastic returns. I think, you know, I think index funds per se are, are also problematic. You, one of the things that the everything bubble did was get rid of active fund managers because active fund managers had huge trouble keeping up with this sort of the incredibly strong U.S. market. So you, most of the U.S. market is now on autopilot on the in the index fund. And I, I found one chart from Nomura, the Japanese broker, a few years ago, which showed that active manager alpha is goes up and down with interest rates. It's curious. So as interest rates went down, alpha went down. So I'm thinking that going forward, active management will do better relative to the index. So that's quite a positive thing. I think private equity is going to be very exposed from now on. I, I was speaking this morning to a friend of mine because I'm writing a preface to my book uh, for the paperback edition. And, and I was saying, you know, we, any, are you, what are you seeing out there? You know, anything that you think I should write about in the book? And he said, it's interesting that private equity hasn't taken any, any losses marked out. Yes. Private equity always does this. Whenever you, Cliff Asnitz of AQR, yes, yes. like say, he was a Goldman during the, in the 87 crash, I suppose, managing a quant book and, you know, the quant equities would be massively down that day. And he passed the sort of Goldman's private equity guy and Cliff said, you know, how much money did you lose today? He said, I didn't lose anything because there was no mark on the book. So there's going to be a late mark on private equity, I think. And private equity... Yes, yes. And there's definitely some troubling sign then with Brit, which Cliff Asnes has also talked a lot about. BRIT, the big private equity or private real estate fund from Blackstone, which has 70 billion in assets, which has not corrected a little bit when the rest of the market is going down. And now people are trying to withdraw money, but it's gated could be, well, I think it's a big warning sign. See, the, the other thing is that the whole private equity business has really only been around in a period of falling interest rates. It starts in 1982, simultaneous, you know, starts in the, uh, yeah, in the early 80s, and then it prospers as the rates come down. And you know, frankly, you know, lower cost of funding, higher valuation of assets, you know, you have to work hard not to make 
money under those circumstances. Bond market cycles tend to last you know, three or four decades. So if we're now going into a three or four decade period of rising rates and private equity, as you're probably aware, you know, had you know, going into this bust, had higher leverage ratios, the quality on their loans was lower, although in fact, actually that helps them because they're covenant like, but they had higher leverage ratios relative to debt. And if, if you move into a world where credit is tighter and rates are more expensive and valuations are lower, I think private equity is probably in some quite deep trouble. This is, this is a very important point, just because this is quite a fundamental aspect. Because this podcast, what I'm doing is very much about the future of investing. And one of the major themes is the democratization of alternatives and in particular private equity. And the argument is typically of 60-40 portfolios is dead. Therefore, you should go into other types of assets. And private equity, Blackstone in particular, is at the forefront of this. And it's a dangerous mix, right? Well, yes, by all means, say the 60-40 portfolio is dead, if you want to call it that way. And by all means, say, yeah, that's the, yeah, that's the yeah, argument. But, but also that indexation, you know, passive investment has gone too far. That's my view. You know, you, you don't want passive, completely dominated markets. So there is room for active management. But the question is, do you want to go with the investments or the alternatives that what were were buoyed? I suppose Americans say buoyed in the with the ultra low rates. And I would say that's the VC and the, you know, uh, uh, private equity. So, you, you know, in some ways, as we're talking, I'm thinking back to, you know, the, you know, Ye the late David Swenson, the sort of Yale portfolio, and you could throw in the more recent um, fashion for risk parity, the type of things that have done very well. Risk parity did very well under falling interest rates because the bond yields did uh, you know, bonds would offset rising uh, of any decline in, in equity market. Private equity did very well. Uh, VC did very well. And I, I don't think, I think all of those, you know, the rising interest rates, rising inflation, uh, and the fact that they, that those things have been overdone mean that they're going to do less well in the future. I, I'm not saying, I think there's a role for active managers. Um, and I think there are, you know, obviously pockets of valuation around the world, you know, my old colleagues at GMO, you know, they point to emerging markets being cheap. They point to Europe being cheap. They point to, I mean, European equities being cheap. Japanese equities look cheap. So I think that, you know, I think that you can find decent investment. I think another thing, George, is that last year, index linked bonds had a terrible time last year. They really sort of, in capital terms, they went down with nominal bonds. And perhaps that was fair enough because their yields were sort of low and negative going at the beginning of last year. Having said that, now we're in a position where I don't know where the you know, US 10-year tip, tip yield is today, but let's say around 1.5%. And I think that inflation-protected bonds are going to be the, the sort of bulwark of the investment portfolio going forward. I think that you know, if you can get 1.5% real plus inflation protection, Look, you, you, George, we always get these things wrong when we talk about what's going to happen in the future. I don't think that the tip yield are going to move with the nominal bond yield indefinitely going forward. I think investors got to sort of wake up to the fact that you know, you're getting one and a half percent and inflation today. So that that seems to me, you know, a really really decent bet. I'm not best bet you ever seen, but a good bet. And I think that. Yeah. I mean, as I say in the book, you know, when interest rates were very low and negative, you had this great virtual wealth. I mean, think of cryptocurrencies. There's nothing there. You just, they talked up something that was nothing. So you get this, when that bus comes, you get a flight into real assets. And what are the real assets in short supply? You know, frankly, you know, energy, hydrocarbons, like it or not, um, commodities, like it or not. So you get the Germans in the hyperinflation, they talk about something called the, the, the flucht in die Sackwerten, the flight into real things. So I think after the virtual bubble or bubble of virtual wealth, you get a flight into real assets, with, you know, commodities, energy, gold, and so forth. So there's a lot to do out there, sure. 
Sure. And so what you mentioned about, you know, the virtual wealth is, I think, what makes it hard to pitch governments and central banks to increase real interest rate for the reason you said, look, net worth is so much higher. Who, who wouldn't want that? But obviously, it comes up, it must come down. So if we're in the everything bubble and we see some, some things that are pretty much collapsing, although even crypto, which is most, mostly the most frothy of the bubble, is still at one tree. Coins at twenty thousand dollars. I wouldn't say it's a complete collapse, but it seems to me that it's what we're witnessing is pretty mild compared to the size of the bubble from two thousand eight, with a bubble from COVID and so on. So, where do you think we're at? Is it because we're early, or is it because that's what it is? Well, I'm I'm in the camp that thinks we're in the early early innings, and there has been, you know, obviously a big hit. Uh, to the markets with this, you know, $30 trillion of losses that I mentioned earlier, of which, I, as you say, you know, $2 trillion come from cryptos, but you still got $1 trillion of cryptos left. And, I mean, perhaps I'm being a tiny bit extreme, but it's not clear to me that cryptos, as things currently stand, have any value whatsoever. So you might say that, you know, I mean, if you're being extreme, and this is, say, the line that, say, Paul Singer of Elliott Park that says, Cryptos should be zero. It's not over until Bitcoin has hit zero. Now, that might be a rather strong statement. I think now, I was talking to another friend of mine earlier today, it appears that we could be on the verge of a regional banking crisis in the US. The yield curve, as you know, steeply inverted. The regional banks have not been passing on the interest rate rises to their depositors. Their deposits are fleeing the regional banks. At the same time, these rising interest rates have hit the value of the securities they hold on their balance sheets. And apparently, there are problems on their commercial mortgage, commercial loans and residential mortgage books. So, you know, these things take a, work, a while to work out through the system. I mentioned earlier that, you know, I was doing work on the credit boom very closely in the early, in the 2000s. And, you know, frankly, that took a long time to play out if you were watching it. You know, we, you know, US house prices peaked in 2006 or possibly 2005. By early 2006, subprime mortgages were, were losing money. Yeah? And that took, if you think about it, it took two and a half years for losses on subprimes to the Lehman's Blow up, and you know the, these things. Everyone always expects, you know, that everything happens very, very quickly. After the fact, the timeline seems to be compressed. But if you're living through it, and if you sort of know what's going on, actually, it takes much longer. I, I was speaking to my old boss Jeremy Grant from last week. His view is, that, you know, what we had uh, in January was a classic bear market rally, which he thought was very similar to the bear market rally of January 2001. So um, if Jeremy's correct, Jeremy thinks you know, the situation is much worse than in the early 2000s. You know, you've got inflation, you've got a war with Russia and so on. And so he thinks that market's not in a trough until next year. And I'd say that I would sort of be, be in that camp. I think I just say, going back to my point earlier, if interest rate, if interest is an omnipresent phenomenon and the ultra low rates worm their way into all economic and financial activity, then it would follow that the everything bubble turns into the everything bust in inverted commas. And, and I think this and one of the points I've made when I've been giving talks recently is this, that over the last 25 years, each crisis has three traits. One is each crisis has a broader geographical reach than the crisis before. We went from the sort of Asian crisis to the dot-com boom to the global financial crisis. But if you remember, the global financial crisis didn't include really China. Now, China's in a much more vulnerable position today than it was 13, 14 years ago. So you've got a broader geographical reach. The other thing is that each crisis 
has cost more, has produced greater losses than the crisis before us. The GFC produced greater losses than the, than the dot-com bust. Then the third thing, and this is quite important, is each crisis is actually more complicated to analyze and identify ex ante than the crisis that preceded it. Like dot-com was pretty in your face. You, know, you had pets.com. It's, it, was, you know, it was pretty obvious. The subprime CDOs, you actually had to do a bit of work to get your head around that. Everyone knows after the fact, but those of us who were following it real time, I was trying to follow it real time. I see, what the hell is a CDO? You know, what is this? So it takes, it was quite complicated. There was stuff that we didn't know. I remember, you know, some hedge fund guy saying to me, you know, if you remember the banks were losing money on these things called SIVs, which were off, off balance sheet lending vehicles. He said, I've never even heard of these things before. And this guy was one of the best hedge fund managers in the state. But I'm saying now the everything, the insinuation, the low interest rates into all activities, ultra low for such long period of time, gives you a much, you know, much wider and more complex potential bust to analyze. So I can't tell you that I know where it's coming. I can tell you, I can tell your listeners to buy my book so at least they have a template in their mind to analyze these things because you know, frankly if they read the books then they're in the same position as me to analyze the problems going forward but i, I certainly my strong conviction is that you know we are not in the ninth innings yet it's not going to end with you know interest rates coming uh, inflation coming back to two percent staying at two percent and the central banks sort of moving back to you know the era of you know of close to zero interest rates i think I think that the central banks are not in a stronger position to reflate the markets as they have been over the past uh, crises. And that puts us into a, a different world. Well, thank you so much, first of all. And indeed, I really think the book is a template. It's something that frames your thinking into, well, something we, we bathe in, something that is it's like gravity issue valuation. And therefore, it's so important. And I'll put the link, of course, in the description. Highly recommend it to everyone. And, uh, Edward, we are so thankful for your time and your insight. It's been an absolute pleasure. And, you know, I look forward to continuing following you and reading you wherever you write. Thanks, Thank George. You. Thanks for having me.